All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming, uh, and we'll get get started now. Um, I know I, I've had a bit of a weather shock coming here, so um, but I'm really happy to be back. And like, it, I think it's a classic, like going from Jakarta to like snowy Africa. It's like a classic Southeast Asia at corner. Very yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll start with an announcement from Samoa, and then I'll introduce you. So I just want to draw everyone's attention to these flyers. There's some out there. Um, the Graduate Education and Training in Southeast Asian Studies is a loose funded initiative that's a consortium of all of the major Southeast Asia centers. So this just gives you a bit of information and how to find the website uh, or find us on social media. And I just wanted to announce that the spring mini course is going to be ASEAN regionalism and the deadline to um, apply to participate in that is February 10th. As a Cornell graduate student, you would be um, uh, high on the list if you're in one of the Getty institutions to participate, but it's open and often the chance to get to know people working on Southeast Asia from all over the world, including the region. Um, and then there are also um, virtual language tables that are under Way. And so I encourage you to check out the Getsy website, and we'll also be doing quite a few Getsy activities leading up to the Association for Asian Studies meetings. So if that's of interest, just check out the Getsy website or talk to me. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm really happy to be introducing Jeremy Ladd um, to kick us off for this semester. Um, he is um, at Cornell um, as a visiting assistant professor, and he researches opposition political parties and movements in electoral authoritarian regimes and emerging democracies. Um, his, his work is focused on Southeast Asia and post -Soviet, um, the post-Soviet region, and has recently been awarded Southeast Asia Research Group um, Fellow Award for 2022. Um, He's going to talk on the unintended consequences of repression in electoral authoritarian regimes in the social media era. So thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real honor, and it's it's really a it's a real privilege to be able to present my research to to a room full of uh, students and scholars of Southeast Asia. So I really look forward to uh, any reactions and, and feedback that you have. And, and thanks for for your time and coming. To remove this. Okay, so <clears throat> I just want to start by noting that uh, this this is a paper I've been working on for a little while, and I'm going to present on on a, a few things. But uh, I, in the final product, I, I will be splitting up the text analysis uh, part into a second uh, paper, just uh, just for your information about uh, in terms of the flow of the presentation. Uh, but my motivation is this. Many citizens around the world uh, today uh, live under uh, what are called electoral authoritarian regimes. And these are otherwise authoritarian regimes that for uh, a variety of reasons, hold nominally uh, free and fair multi-party elections, not really free and fair usually, but nomin nominally free and fair multi-party elections. Uh, and one such regime is Hun Sen's uh, in Cambodia. Uh, and this is uh, Sen voting in one of these elections for which the outcome is, is already known. And some of the things that differentiate uh, these regimes from democracies or, or sort of the characteristics of authoritarianism that they take on uh, include things like uh, assassination and physical attacks against opponents yeah. of the regime. And so this is a funeral procession for Cambodian opposition uh, activist Ken Lay who was shot dead uh, in the streets of uh, Phnom Penh. Uh, and this can also take the form of arbitrary detention or lawfare. And so also from Cambodia, this is an example of, of this is the arrest of Kem Saka. He was one of the leaders of the party that I'll be speaking about uh, in this presentation. Uh, arrested on trumped up charges of uh, fomenting a color revolution with America uh, in Cambodia. At the time, the, the charges have evolved over the last few years. And this can also involve the crafting of institutions uh, to exclude real challengers, really to, to favor the incumbent or to preclude free association or the free exchange of information. And this uh, pretty accurately captures what Cambodia has been like in terms of the opposition uh, since uh, 2018. But one of the factors that importantly distinguishes electoral authoritarian regimes, that's played here, electoral authoritarian regimes from totalitarian regimes or many outright dictatorships in the past 
uh, is the selective and targeted use of that repression. And that's something we can also highlight uh, in the Cambodian context as well. If we were to ask ourselves, for example, who is targeted uh, for death, who is targeted for repression uh, under the Khmer Rouge, uh, the answer is pretty much everybody. Obviously, some people are free from that from that targeting, but the general population is, is at risk for, for being targeted. Right? That differentiates, uh, and, and I apologize, it's still here like this, I don't know why. That differentiates uh, totalitarian regimes from electoral authoritarian regimes. It certainly differentiates uh, Hun Sen's regime uh, from the Khmer Rouge, uh, and that is part of the rhetoric of the regime. It's better. This is better than the Khmer Rouge. Uh, so under Hun Sen's regime and, and other electoral authoritarian regimes, uh, it is not everybody that is targeted. It is usually just leading opposition activists uh, on a regular basis and maybe in times of crisis uh, obvious supporters uh, of those of those movements. Right? Most people, uh, you know, who may or may not support the opposition, and in Cambodia, many millions of people have, for a variety of reasons, that at different points in time, uh, come up to opposition rallies or supported them in elections. Uh, for uh, most people, their daily lives do not consist of uh, the enslavement to or the evasion of repression by uh, the regime that they live under in, in the electoral authoritarian regime context. Right? Life under the Khmer Rouge is qual qualitatively different obviously, uh, for, the, for the average Cambodian than, than life under Hun Sen's regime, right? So that, that's something that differentiates these regimes, and that is that repression is happening in the same way. You, you could be killed, you could be arrested for no reason, but it's much more targeted in, in the electoral authoritarian regime context. And so I'm going to argue here that the selective repression that, that characterizes these regimes also comes with unintended consequences. And that is that it can draw attention to an increased engagement with the targets of that repression. <clears throat> and, and what I'm saying here is that because these regimes are uh, almost by definition uh, informationally scarce environments, at least in terms of free information, because it's free informationally scarce environments, uh, the, the act of repression uh, is an information rich signal and, and an otherwise vacuum of, of free information. It's telling citizens something. Uh, about the regime's opponents uh, that is important information that is otherwise obfuscated intentionally uh, by the regime through control of media uh, or by not directly mentioning uh, who, who their uh, viable opponents are, for, for example, or by filling the informational space with a lot of meaningless information. Okay. So I'm going to do some uh, brief housekeeping here. And this is just a note I put up to, to remind you because I'm speaking broadly here. This, this presentation is about Hun Sen's regime and it is going to be about the Cambodian National Rescue Party, which no longer exists, uh, but was the leading opposition party until 2017. Uh, and uh, as a preface, I will be looking at, or as a, as a foreshadowing, I'll be looking at engagement on Facebook, but I'd like to do some brief housekeeping before I get there, which is just to make clear, uh, because people will come from different backgrounds uh, in the audience, what are these electoral authoritarian regimes? Uh, so in, in political science, we, we usually define these regimes as regimes that have adopted many features of democracy, uh, but that violate at least one of the minimal criteria. There, there's a lot of literature around this, uh, especially about 20 years ago, where, where scholars are trying to understand what's been happening uh, with, uh, with uh, widespread democratization around the world after the Cold War in the 90s with democratic conditionality and the institutionalization of regimes that look like they're democratic, but, but really aren't. And, and what sort of comes out of this, and it's not the, the only uh, term that has been accepted, but uh, what comes out of this is this definition of, of some of these regimes and electoral authoritarian regimes that they'll, they'll adopt elections, they'll say that they protect uh, civil and political rights, that everybody has the right to vote and to run for government, uh, etc. But they're violating at least one thing uh, which allows the, the government in power, the incumbent government, or, or the authoritarian in power to stay there. That's what these regimes are. And these, again, these minimal criteria include things like civil and political liberties, uh, like uh, free and fair elections, uh, an even playing field between incumbent and opposition, and universal suffrage. So these regimes violate at least one of these things, and it's it's most often uh, free and fair elections and some civil and political liberties. That, so it's most often everything except universal suffrage, I apologize. But most importantly for staying in power is, of course, uh, these three that they're, they're violating in some way. Okay. And uh, it's important to uh, understand these regimes uh, and to understand regimes like Cambodia, as, as we'll focus on in this case, because they are the modal regime in the world today. It's not a 
it's not a niche uh, sort of regime outcome in the world. It is actually the, the most common form or the most common type of regime that we see around the world today since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and this is just a, a chart that I made from varieties of democracy data where electoral autocracies uh, here are coterminous with uh, electoral authoritarian regime. And we can see that they were not that common uh, 100 years ago, but after the third wave uh, started, after the people power movement starts, after the USSR collapses, and after democratic conditionality becomes uh, something that's tied to a lot of bilateral aid, obviously not all uh, bilateral and multilateral aid, but to, to a lot of it, we see that these regimes really uh, really become the modal regime in all years except for one or two uh, over here and over here. So they're important to understand, and it's important to understand uh, what's going on uh, in these regimes also because they're less stable than democracies and less stable than fully authoritarian regimes. So because they're the most common form of regime, uh, and also because there's a lot going on uh, or there's more going on most of the time than in other forms of regimes in terms of regime dynamics, in terms of the possibility of change to more authoritarianism or to more democracy. And in Cambodia, we can see that as well. There's been a lot of variation under Hun Sen uh, in terms of how much room is uh, allowed for democratic opposition uh, or, or not. And the reason it's important to look at opposition parties and understand what's going on there is because they form uh, one, not the only, but one of the important explanations for regime change. Uh, and some of those explanations look at single cases uh, like Green's work and Magaloni's work on uh, long durée opposition in Mexico. Uh, some look at coalitions, uh, which is a jumping off point for my motivation, uh, uh, which uh, posits that you know when oppositions unite, that there is going to be uh, some movement in regime type. Uh, and some just formally theorize the work that oppositions do, but there's a lot of focus on oppositions as as the first mover uh, in regime change. Not as the only possible explanation, but, it, but it's one of the many uh, good explanations in, in cases that we can observe. And the focus on conditions as drivers of change has, uh, coalition, sorry, as drivers of change has given rise to a new literature uh, that asks, uh, why did these opposition parties choose to coalesce or to unite uh, against, the, uh, against the authoritarian incumbent? And that's been a lot of the focus in this line of research in, in the past few years. And that's my jumping off point, uh, which is that there's a question for me that goes unanswered, uh, which is uh, that what are these parties even doing to, to form these coalitions? How are they present to do any of this in the first place? This is the puzzle that motivates my larger research. Uh, and the question uh, that I'm looking at in this paper is this, what are the mechanisms through which opposition parties can attract and build support? I wanna know uh, why in the general sense, people start paying attention to these parties, uh, along with why people form them right? and why people choose to support them. And in this case, I want to know what the dynamics of that are uh, for the Cambodian National Rescue Party uh, in Cambodia. Okay, so I have a theory, uh, and that is that uh, repression in electoral authoritarian regimes uh, draws attention to and increases engagement with the targets of that repression. Uh, so that's one, again, this is one explanation. There are obviously a lot of things that go into why people support the opposition. But this is uh, one answer that I think uh, we can see uh, in the evidence in Cambodia and that, and, and that is generalizable to other contexts. And uh, while we can certainly study this kind of question uh, with uh, more traditional approaches uh, in political and social research, I think this kind of research is uniquely enabled uh, by uh, more novel social media data. Uh, and the reason I think that is because it allows us to study these things without endangering people. It allows us to study these things, such as does repression cause more engagement uh, or more uh, support or more attention. It allows us to study these things without a focus, uh, without, a, without any onus being placed on whether recall is at play, uh, whether there's artificiality at play in experimental research, or whether in our interviews, elites are uh, filtering the kind of information they're giving us. Right? And, and you can think of like, uh, you know, if, you, the Rose Revolution happened, and, and you otherwise think that it's great that it happened, you know, and an academic comes and asks you uh, a year later if you were there, the, the problem is that you might say that you were when you weren't, right? That, that's a real problem in research, and, and social media data allows us to really tackle stuff like this. And, and for me, 
it, it, it allows me to look at what's happening in moments of repression without directly endangering uh, people uh, by talking to them about the, the repression that's happening. So I think it's uniquely enabled by social media data for reasons like that, and more specifically because it's always on, right? This is one of uh, Salganik's uh, descriptions of, of big data, right? So, like, big data systems are always on, so the information is being collected whether we're using it or not, and it's there for us to treat as, as an archive. Uh, but also because social media is uh, liberation technology, to quote Diamond, uh, that is that uh, these platforms are being used directly by opposition movements and authoritarian regimes for the daily work of opposition. So it's not a, it's not a mistake that they're on there, they're actively on there. And so are authoritarians. We've seen over time that authoritarian regimes have become more concerned with controlling uh, the online environment. So they are on there as well, uh, trying to stop opposition from happening. And this uh, theory also draws on several recent findings that are also based on uh, social data, uh, which is that in China, for example, we know that online censorship leads to increased access of censored information. That when people see that information is being hidden by the regime, they will look for it, right? That crisis situations lead people to evade censorship and search for unfiltered information, right? That people understand, or some people understand, of course, not, not everybody, but there is uh, control of the online environment happening or the information environment happening and in crisis to look for information that they think is free information. And we know that for Twitter, uh, this is just uh, this is a similar finding uh, that on, when it comes to Twitter and opposition leaders in Saudi Arabia, we know that uh, when they are arrested, they get a spike in followers and there's a spike in Google searches for them. So this directly jumps off of that sort of side finding of, of Pan and Siegel as well, but in the Cambodian case. All right, so here, again, I'm evaluating as a case, uh, San Renzi and the Cambodian National Rescue Party. Uh, and so this is uh, San Renzi on, my, on your left. Uh, the Cambodian National Rescue Party was founded by him and by Kem Saka, who I've already brought up uh, on your right. Uh, and it was a leading opposition party in Cambodia until 2017 uh, when it was dissolved. For a little background, uh, this party is the result of a merger uh, between Sam Rainsy's party, uh, which is called the Sam Rainsy Party, originally called the Khmer Nation Party, but uh, only for a couple of years, uh, and Kem Saka's Human Rights Party. And both Rainsy and Saka have been longtime activists uh, in Cambodia since the early 90s. Right, and uh, this party was very successful uh, right after its founding. Uh, as you can see, the Sam Rainsy Party was already uh, quite successful uh, in 1998 when the first election, uh, it was the third largest party in the system. Uh, and by 2008, it was the second largest party. And then when the CNRP is formed in 2013, we can see they almost win. They get up into the mid forties in terms of vote uh, and in terms of uh, seat proportions uh, in the legislature. And this leads, uh, because of its success, uh, this, is, this is not evaluated here. This leads to the banning of the party and, and the closure of the, of the party system. Uh, in Cambodia, it becomes a hegemonic, what we would call a hegemonic authoritarian regime in 2018, where only the, the authoritarian incumbent party then holds seats in the national legislature, as opposed to a uh, year before that, holding only around 50%, uh, just over 50% of the seats. Okay. Okay. Uh, and this is just a picture of a CNRP rally. I, I just want to highlight that this party was widely supported, and not just in the voting booth, but also on the streets. Maybe not uh, today, but uh, in this period that, I, that I'm looking at, they were they were really good at getting people out onto the street and protest against the regime. And I remember while I was doing my field work, I, I always noticed that you know a lot of uh, tuk-tuk drivers. I mean, we shouldn't in, make population inferences from tuk-tuk drivers, but I'm just saying we could see the like under the steering wheel. A lot of them had the CNRP hats for when like rallies were happening. Right? Obviously, we're not wearing them to drive, but they were they were ready to go. So I just want to address why I'm looking at Facebook in Cambodia. I'm not looking at Facebook because Facebook is cool, uh, but I'm looking at it because I think it's relevant to Cambodia, right? Uh, and A, it's very popular in Cambodia, but I want to uh, address that uh, a little bit. I think about 70% uh, of the population or more is, is estimated to be on Facebook. It's not abnormal. I think everybody who's in, in a country that's gone completely online is probably on Facebook. I guess it matters if you're actually using it or paying attention to it. That's a dynamic that I'm facing right now as, as a 40 year old uh, uh, academic talking to my students about Facebook who think Facebook is for old people. Right? So, right? so uh, Facebook is important in Cambodia for a variety of reasons. Uh, Morgan Besser and people that I've interviewed have found that it has directly diluted the government control of the media. Uh, and the CNRP is aware of this, as I'll mention too. Second is that Facebook is highly political 
That is the pages of politicians, particularly in this period, are the popular pages in the country. We we can we could see that in audience audience insights at the time that it's not just Nike or like uh, boxing or something like that that were the top pages, but also Sam Rainsy is is one of the top ten pages in the country. And we know that the CNRP acted on this information. Uh, they use it directly to proselytize members of the party. Were senior members of the party uh, said that they stopped. They used to refuse to enter the legislature after elections in exchange, and only enter in exchange for demands that were met. And those demands often included uh, radio stations and newspapers so that they could communicate with their grassroots. So they said they stopped doing that uh, when Facebook became a big thing because they could see that everybody was talking to them, going to their Facebook, uh, and that was a way that they could disseminate information uh, and uh, that they were directly training uh, lower level members to use Facebook uh, to speak to the grassroots you know, when it came to elections and things like that. Right, and we know that uh, Sam Rainsy and Hansen in particular were engaged in some sort of competition in the words of one senior member of the party to, to show Cambodians who is the coolest young guy uh, on Facebook. But if you go to Sam Rainsy's page now, that's not what you're gonna see. Uh, he's, he's less, at least his Facebook page is less relevant to uh, the day-to-day -day politics in, in Cambodia today. But back then there was a real competition and everybody was talking about it. The newspapers were talking about it. The politicians were talking about it. It was, it was a really big thing. Uh, and it was a really big thing for Hun Sen to show that he was cooler than Sam Rainsy. And uh, there's some uh, investigative journalism, I should know that is not uh, peer reviewed, uh, but it's uh, investigative journalism. Uh, and because of this desire to be more popular than Sam Rainsy, uh, some people uh, who, who looked into it were saying that the evidence suggested that Hun Sen was paying click farms to get his millions of followers, but that most of Rainsy's followers were originating inside Cambodia. And that's another reason why uh, I think the data is useful because of this outside, uh, you know, exogenous to this research finding that Hansen is paying click farms and Rainsy is, is probably not. And uh, luckily for me, this is right before the Facebook API closure. And so I'm able to uh, freely access, uh, at least the data that I'm using for this, I was able to freely access and download everything on Sam Rainsy's page. And so that means I was able to collect all the posts that he made uh, but also all the engagement with all the posts that he made and also all the users who were responsible uh, for all the engagement with all the posts that he made. And so what I do is just that. I collected everything. It took about 48 hours. I messed up a couple of times. So really it took a couple of weeks because like my program would break. <laughs> That's not important information, but <laughs> right. But eventually uh, it happens and I got all the, uh, all the data off of Brainsy's page from when he started it. So it's not a arbitrary decision to start here. This is the beginning of his page in, in 2013. He starts a Facebook page. Uh, and this is just before the API closure. Uh, I had been, so I didn't collect it all uh, at once. I was updating the collections until the, then the API closed for public access, which is a good thing. Just as a side note, excellent decision on the part of Facebook, uh, because certainly if I have uh, an account, uh, so if I have a, a hard drive with uh, user information on the millions of people who have supported Sam Rainsy, uh, probably the regime does as well. So, okay. So before I start talking about uh, uh, what this data is and, and how I'm gonna analyze it, I just wanna remind you uh, what I'm doing here. So I have this theory that repression in electoral authoritarian regimes draws attention to and increases engagement with the targets of that repression. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is, operationalize and measure uh, engagement as likes on Facebook. I'm not saying that's a, not saying that's a perfect line down, but I think it's a reasonable one. And I think it's reasonable for these reasons. One is that uh, we know that we can uh, model, for example, election results on Facebook likes. And, and many scholars have done this again before the API closure mostly, but there's a lot more research coming out again now that there's a mechanism through which research can, researchers can access this data. But, uh, we know that we can model electoral outcomes uh, in India, for example, New Zealand, the UK, Denmark, uh, Finland. So this is a thing that has been done. Uh, and we know that Facebook likes from other fields tell us a lot about uh, users, uh, and that could be their partisanship, their race, their gender, their sexuality, something about their intelligence, and something about their health, right? And that's all to say that although there is certainly some randomness at play in what people are liking, we can't deny that. It is not a random process in general, right? That when somebody likes, you know, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, it's because they like donuts, probably, right? And that's probably associated with their health in some way, right? <laughs> right. They may also accidentally like something else, and we can't deny that, but on the whole, on average, uh, there's 
likes are not blindly given, but given to things that people are, are intentionally liking. So that's uh, what I'm, why I'm suggesting that it may not be a perfect line, but I think it's a reasonable line to, to look at. And there's a lot of other research, obviously, on what's going on in social media as well to, to support that. Uh, secondly, is, is that there's a bit of a problem uh, trying to operationalize uh, repression, which is my independent variable here, because in electoral authoritarian regimes, it, it's happening sort of all the time. It, it is happening. Right. But what happens sort of uh, serendipitously what, while I'm doing field research in, in Cambodia for uh, this and, and uh, what obviously later I gathered the data. It, but what, what's happening is that in February of 2017, uh, after local elections have happened, Hun Sen's regime or Hun Sen himself, I don't know, decided that, look, this experiment is over. This, this regime, this, this party is no longer allowed to exist. And what happens is that there were local elections and the CNRP continued to make electoral gains. They didn't win a majority of local uh, local election, like seats in local uh, government bodies, but they reproduced their 2013 result in that they almost won a lot of places. Right? And so the government was thinking, what if they win the next election? And the CNRP was openly saying, we're going to win the next election. Like that's uh, members of the party were just saying that to me in interviews. So we, we think we're going to win the next election. And, uh, and this is an aside. And we think that the regime is going to be okay with it because we've been working with them in the legislature for so long. I just, I just like to point this out how unexpected this was for people that that they were saying just just a couple of weeks before uh, Hemsaka was arrested, we're going to win, and not just that, but the regime is going to accept it because we work with them in committees. We're in the legislature; they know us, we know them, and even members of the CPP who I was lucky enough uh, to interview were saying similar things that we know these people, like we trust them, everything's going to be fine. Uh, but it wasn't, and so the party is banned. The legal ban came down in February, which is before a uh, month, like almost half a year before Kim Saka's arrest. But it didn't seem like it was really a thing until uh, Saka was arrested. Uh, and so uh, I operationalized repression here as, as a known period of novel or heightened repression. It, to make a long story short, I apologize that I gave you the long story, uh, which is that uh, I, I think there's a qualitatively different uh, character to the repression that happens in the summer of. 2017 or beginning in September, sorry, the beginning of September 2017 until November, where a regime that was an electoral authoritarian regime that allowed opposition, I'll be allowed opposition to lose, decided that that's not even allowed anymore either. We're going to start making some arrests uh, and we're going to ban this party that, uh, although knew that, you know, the main partner in the party had been around since the 90s, right, since the mid 90s. Okay. So I thought this was new and that's how I choose to operationalize uh, my independent variable. And so I, through these uh, operationalizations and measurements, I derived this uh, more specified hypothesis, which is just that in known periods of novel or heightened repression against the Cambodian National Rescue Party, we should expect to see more likes on Sam Rainsy's Facebook posts. And I, and I should point out, I'm looking at Sam Rainsy's page because he's uh, he was the main leader of the party uh, and had this, again, this widely known Facebook page that people were going to for political information. Uh, so I do not look at uh, the party's Facebook page or Ken Saka's Facebook page uh, because I wanted to look at the page that was getting uh, already getting the most attention and known to be where the information was coming from. And, and as you'll see, he tried to use this page as, as a news source for people as well. This was where people were getting information. Right, so this is the break I'm looking at here. This is the increased period of repression. Uh, and although it is uh, sort of against the rules, right, to, to visually uh, assess time series. That's like the first thing you'll learn in a time series course is don't do that, right? You can see there's probably something else going on here. And I just want to point out, if you're thinking that, I mean, you're right, that that's the local election that the CNRP almost won, like they reproduced the 2013 results, right? And uh, this is obviously February, like some things are still happening, but I wanted to look at, at specifically, and I, I do test the structural break for this, but I wanted to look at specifically this period of heightened repression. And so the first thing I do uh, is, apologize, uh, I just want to catch it in my notes to make sure I don't miss an important period here, right? So I said, or an important point here, right? So I set up this structural break test. It's just a test for known structural breaks, the wall test. Uh, that's the first thing I do with the data is I want to know if this period on the, you know, on the level of time series analysis here, I'm going to say couple jargon words, but I'll keep it light. I want to know if the data generating process for likes on San Rainsy's posts is different uh, in this period of repression as defined by me, uh, given uh, what I think is going on on the ground. 
than at other periods in the time series. I want to know if the, that data generating process is different. Uh, and uh, I do that by estimating a walled structural break test for known structural breaks. And what I find, as you can see uh, from the, you know, the p values, is that yes, uh, there is uh, statistical support for uh, the alternative hypothesis that is that I'm rejecting a null hypothesis that there is uh, no difference in the data generating process, right? There's something different going on. That's not a lot of information. I will go deeper as you will see. It's not a lot of information, but it is important information that from uh, 2nd September, that's the arrest of Kem Saka to 16th November, that's when the courts finally come down and say it's over. There's no more CNRP party. There's something different uh, in the process driving lines for, for Sam Rainsy's posts. Uh, and just for a little bit more rigor, I, I should have opened this before. I just apologize for this. I, I do, uh, I'm not gonna get too deep into this because it's, this would be uh, much more jargon. Uh, I just wanna say for a little bit uh, of a more rigorous test, I do engage in uh, more sophisticated univariate time series analysis to try to uh, model uh, the series to produce uh, white noise residuals. That is to model out uh, in, uh, the ways in which the series predicts itself given past values, for example, or, or given these known structural breaks. And what I want you to take away from this uh, is just that it is impossible to, to model this series uh, without including information uh, about uh, this period of repression and without including information about this, uh, without including information about the 2017 election period, which is, uh, I talk about more in the paper, is, is also uh, structurally different, which, which should make sense. I, I include that as a test of the series because we know that people should behave differently towards the online uh, presences of politicians in periods where they're under, undergo, undergoing elections, I apologize. So that you know, you're more likely to look at Joe Biden's page, for example, when he's running than you are like in your day-to-day -day life. Obviously there are hardcore supporters and, and we'll see that here as well, who are, who are looking every day, but the general population is gonna be more interested in looking at the kind of usually boring things politicians say uh, in, in elections, right? Uh, so it's impossible to model the series without this information. Uh, and also importantly that this series is a volatility series, which is basically that, that this information, along with uh, knowledge of the previous uh, lights, for example, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a model that is an autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity time series. Uh, that is that, I'm gonna go back to the model, to the series so we can look at it. That is that the independent variables that we include uh, are not modeling absolute values. Uh, but our modeling increases in volatility, that is increases in variance uh, in the series, right? And what that tells us is that in this uh, in these periods, like in this period of repression, it's not that every post that Sam Rainsy likes uh, gets uh, more likes, it's that the likelihood of a post getting many more likes than is the average uh, is higher, right? And we can see that these are the posts with spikes, right? And that's a function of the granularity of the data. I would like to point out that this will be the last Jargon thing I'm going to say about this is mo most time series analysis, uh, especially in political science, aggregates data to discrete time. We'll say, like, these are the likes you got on this day or in this month. And that sort of smooths out uh, series. Uh, and that allows for uh, avoiding things like arch garch models because there, there will be less volatility. So the, the, the fact that this is a volatility model is also a function of the granularity of, of the information as much as it is because it's volatile. Right? That's uh, as an aside. Apologize, I'm gonna to try to make sure everything else is more exciting uh, than that. Right. Uh, so that's that's what I'm saying. Uh, to reiterate what, what I'm concluding here uh, before we move on is that there's something different here. Things are different. Some posts are getting way more likes than are, is normally the case for, for Sam Rainsy. And that is happening in this period that I define as the repression period. And it's also happening in this local election period. People are paying more attention. Uh, and so that's support for my hypothesis. I'm going to go deeper, but that's support for my hypothesis that when repression is happening, this is the, the story in real life. When Kem Saka is getting arrested and when the party is being dissolved by the courts, uh, significantly more people are going on to Sam Rainsy's Facebook page and looking at his posts and also engaging with them, also hitting the like button. Okay. So that, but because of the, the granularity of this data, because of the way that we get, or the, the depth of data we can get from social media platforms, I'm able to ask another question here, 
which is, is volatility in the structural break random? That's the next question I'm going to ask, and, and this is all going to be a lot smoother uh, than time series. Okay. So to answer this question, I do a traditional uh, content analysis, and I just I do this manually because I'm just looking in this period here. So we're only looking at a, like a couple hundred, a couple hundred posts, not uh, thousands of posts. So I, I manually code uh, what the posts are about. In this period, uh, Sam Rinzi is posting in three languages, the same thing. I do pass this uh, Kamai in French language posts. He's posting in Kamai, French, and English. I do pass the Kamai in French to uh, translation API to make sure it's the same. And he's just doing one, two, three. And that's because the CNRP was visible in, in some international reporting. Uh, and uh, Sam Rainsy really wants to be visible to international reporting. And, and so he was just probably just making that news available to everybody. Uh, and it's also that he lives in France. And so it's posting in French. And there are a lot of uh, Kamai diaspora in Canada and, and America and Australia who are speaking English. Maybe their children don't, don't speak Kamai. And maybe he wants them to understand that as well because they're, they're a very important source of funding. So they were a very important source of funding for the, for the CNRP. So for whatever reason, it's in three languages. Uh, and this is basically what Sam uh, Rainsy is talking about in this post. He talks about news. He was trying to be uh, sort of a news service for, uh, in a lot of his posts for, for Cambodians, say this is what's going on, this is free information. Uh, he also reports international reporting about himself. It seems to be about prestige. Says I was mentioned in the Wall Street Journal, look at me like I'm amazing and therefore the party is amazing. Everybody's paying attention. He mentions a little bit about the dissolution of the party uh, more than other things, but not as much as news and reporting and, uh, and uh, about the arrest of Kim Saka. Uh, and so that's what he's talking about. And what I want to know is, uh, does this help us understand where that volatility is coming from? That is, that are the, the spikes in engagement coming randomly with uh, topics that Sam Rainsy talks about all the time? Or, or is it the topic itself that's driving the spike in, spike in engagement in this period? Uh, and I find uh, support that it's the con for the idea that it's the content that drives engagement in that we can, I, as I will demonstrate, we can see that users engage less uh, with uh, more frequent topics in these periods, right? So the international, so the news, for example, people are are not really liking. Uh, but when Ramsey says something like, uh, Hun Sen is giving our country away to Vietnam, which he likes to say and usually gets time added to his in absentia jail convictions, mm -hmm. then a lot of people will like that. Right, they'll say, yeah, that's right, and that's a big thing uh, for the Cambodian diaspora as well. It's the resistance for for, for whatever reason that then I don't not for whatever reason like it's inappropriate. I just because I don't study uh, this part of Cambodian politics uh, for my research that for, that Cambodian nationalism uh, has, uh, is really about uh, not liking Vietnamese people when it comes to the the bad side of nationalism. Right, so if they say Hun Sen is giving our country away to, to Vietnam and he's like a puppet of the Vietnamese, uh, then people get really hyped up about that, right? Okay. And it's, there's also personal messages and statements about the support base that might be stall holders at markets or, or garment factory workers was a big support base for CNRP. Immediately after their dissolution, uh, Hun Sen himself showed up at the garment factories, handing out money and promising maternity, right? He knew that that was their support base. That was like the next day, like that's, that's where he was. It's not gonna be that bad. And I guess it worked. Uh, but uh, so statements about the support base, personal messages to supporters, criticism of government, that's what gets likes, and it's not what Rainsy talks about the most. Uh, what Rainsy likes to talk about now, uh, if you look at this page, are, are things like, I've gone skiing. Watch me poorly ski down like this little slope. Okay. So uh, what I can conclude from this, and this is going to lead into the final step of this analysis, is that uh, volatility uh, is something we can model. It's not a random process in the structural break, but it seems to be uh, tied to uh, the content of posts, right? So we have more attention, uh, and that, that suggests that parties need to use this attention to turn over uh, something into support or engagement, right? So this is for to turn over into engagement. Uh, I'm being a little uh, agnostic here about whether engagement is, is offline support. I think there's uh, a lot of research that would suggest that we, we can say that, including the research that, that I've cited. Uh, but at least to turn over uh, attention to engagement, uh, you need to do something else, right? And, and that for Rainsy, that's you need to make the post that's engaging, and, and that shouldn't be surprising, right? If you, you know, like something insane happened, and I would like to to find out what's going on, and then there's uh, a really boring politician saying something really boring on on their website. You're probably not going to do the long to, to like uh, to hit the like button. But because we know that uh, volatility is uh, driven by 
uh, repression and that spikes in volatility that increased attention and engagement uh, is driven by the content of posts. I can also ask the question, uh, who's doing all that liking uh, for the spikes in the volatility period that who likes these posts that get more likes? And so that's the final part of the analysis. Uh, and what I wanted to determine is if it's the same people who have liked posts in the past or if this is attracting new users. And for me, this is sort of like a most likely case uh, of, sorry, I, I don't want to use that. That's more like as a different, I mean, the, the, the CNRP is already popular. And so what, I want, what I'm interested to know is, is if a party that is already really popular and that already has millions of followers is still generating new users following them and liking posts in these periods. And I think that would be very informative uh, information. If it's somebody that's already well-known is still attracting uh, likes. All right, so what I do is I organize uh, users by the number of posts they've liked since 2013 on Reigns' page. Most people, uh, most users have only liked a single post. The median uh, is two, as you can see here. So 50% uh, of like two or less. Uh, the mean user has liked six posts. So you can see this is skewed. Uh, and that is that there is some hardcore following. You can see in the, the, as the tail goes out here that is liking a lot of posts. It's not surprising. Some people are you know, really into following politicians, right? Uh, and so what I do is I organize these users by how many posts they like, right? So uh, I create a group uh, of users who have liked only one post. There's uh, over one and a half million of these. Uh, I've created a group of people, of uh, users who have liked two to six posts. So that's the median to uh, the mean number of posts. I create a group uh, of people who have liked seven, users who have liked seven to 24 posts. That's the one uh, above the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. And finally, more than one standard deviation above the mean number of like posts is, is the fourth group of 25 plus. And these are obviously uh, users who are really hardcore supporters of, of Ramsey's page. At least they're liking all the posts they're on their own. And these are new people in whatever period they come in. Uh, and so what I want to know is uh, what is the likelihood of a new user uh, or somebody who has only engaged with one of, you know, one or two of Ramsey's posts uh, liking uh, a spiked post, a post with a lot of engagement in the volatil volatility period versus other posts. And what I find is this, and here I, I organize these groups like this. It's their first like, it's a moderate user that's two to six, and then we have heavy and loyal users. And what I find is that if we're looking at a post on a attractive topic, like Han Sen gave five kilometers away to uh, Vietnam, that's that's a real thing. There's, you know, one of Ray's convictions is him at the border and like uh, taking pictures of border posts and, and claiming that they were moved overnight or something like a few kilometers in section that Cambodia is on the other side of the post and this is some things fault. If he does something like that, uh, the people who are liking the posts are much more likely to be first and moderate users. So they, they constitute the majority of likes on posts like that. Uh, whereas uh, run of the mill posts uh, are liked in the majority by people who are heavily engaged uh, with Reigns. And so for me, that is evidence that even though Ramsey is well known, uh, he is attracting in this period uh, where the party is being repressed uh, and he is effectively turning over uh, an increase in attention that they receive into engagement. He's, he's attracting the engagement of new users, right? Which uh, is the in case and in data support for uh, my broader theory, which is that in these periods of repression, uh, that in electoral authoritarian regimes, because that repression is targeted, it has this uh, backlash wherein uh, it directs the attention of citizens to uh, what the regime does not want them to pay attention to. In this case, uh, who the real opposition is right? and who is threatening uh, to them. Right. So I'm, I just wanna conclude on a couple of points here. One is this, that repression by the regime led to an increase in likes for Sam Rainsy's post. That's as predicted by the hypothesis. Uh, but importantly, this is uh, an increase in volatility in likes, which can be modeled on the content of posts and was driven primarily by users who had not interacted with Reigns' post before or who had only a limited number of interactions with his posts. Okay? Uh, the out-of-data implication is that repression draws attention to and increases engagement with opposition parties targeted for repression uh, in electoral authoritarian regimes. And uh, what all of this means is that the selective repression that characterizes these regimes comes with a cost. That is, I mean, it sends an information-rich signal in what is otherwise typically a controlled scarce information environment. And what that signal says is that this is the real uh, and potentially threatening opposition to the regime. And I just, I apologize, I just have two points. I, I didn't mean to talk for 40 minutes, uh, but these, these are the last points. I just 
I think the power of this finding for my theory is that new acts of repression continue to add engagement, as I said, with an already existing party. Uh, and I, another reason I'm looking at this is because we do have a tree in the forest problem here, which is that I can't say, you know, in, in a totalitarian regime where you can try to stop somebody from getting popular in the first place uh, by just targeting everybody, right? That that could characterize Khmer Rouge, that, that could characterize Stalinist repressions, right? Like you're Latvian, you might have friends that are Latvian, so let's, let's get you all in the gulag, right? You can't really do that in an electoral authoritarian regime. Right, uh, so that's something we can't really study. That's a tree in the forest problem. Like, would somebody have become popular? Uh, so we have to look at people who are known. And I, but I think it's uh, important uh, information that somebody who is this well known continues to increase uh, engagement and attention with uh, acts of repression. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, none of this means. Just as the final point, none of this means that. Uh, the party would be ultimately successful. I think uh, what I'm looking at here is something we don't normally get to see, uh, which is the the you know the the gaze of citizens making a decision. Are we going to go out into the streets and protest? Is this going to be a revolution? Before we had access to data like this, we could only see when that happened, right? That you did go out into the streets and protest, your revolution succeeded or failed, right? But we we didn't really get to see people looking at at information, right? People actually. Uh, collecting that data and saying, is there is, is something going to happen? And if something is going to happen, am I going to go out and support it, right? And this kind of shows us that, right? That, that people are looking because nothing happened, right? The, the party was dissolved, but people looked, right? And, and I think that's that's the important and novel thing that we have access to in this new data environment that, that we didn't have as clean access to before, right? 